know, he, he, he zips out of the studio as quick as he can on Sunday, just to avoid, you know, having a conversation, I think. Good evening, everyone. Jam Dolphin here with you, and as always, thank you for watching. Hope you have your Bibles ready. Just want to give you a little insight about what it must be like for some of these denominational preachers to uh, be sitting back and knowing they don't agree with what we are teaching, but yet knowing their doctrine is not strong enough to answer or to defend because always what happens is they, they either... Uh, are forced to run or are they run and hide before they even come on and so we hope that you will recognize that we're giving you an answer from the Bible and that, and that it, there must be a reason why your preacher your pastor Bishop Rabbi won't do this um, you know we could list a whole slew of preachers who have said they'd come on and won't come on or did come on and wish they hadn't come on uh, and so uh, we hope that you will start questioning you know what it is about the doctrine that they're teaching that cannot stand scrutiny. I will say this. I know that uh, Brother Johnny Robertson has a couple of uh, debates lined up in the next few weeks, and so we'll see how that fares. I think one of them actually may be an a individual who tried to get us to debate a couple of Baptist preachers, and one of them uh, wouldn't come on. Uh, Jerry Carter did come on, but then refused to come back on. And uh, the other one, uh, Norman... Uh, Jim Norman up in a uh, Baptist church up in Eden uh, would never come on. And I think uh, he was the champion that this uh, fellow that's coming on with uh, Brother Johnny Robertson, I believe this Sunday night, is, uh, is the one who touted. He they, were there, they were his champions, and, and, uh, and so maybe he, he decided, well, if his champions won't do it, maybe he will. So anyway, I may have the wrong uh, man in, in mind, but nonetheless, it is true that they were put up and as champions and then failed to come through. So we hope you realize that we're not afraid to give an, give an answer. We hope that you were ready to uh, uh, ask a question of us and, and discuss God's word with us tonight. The topic for tonight is really has to do with something that I think is, is prevalent in our society, especially in the religious community. But it's something that people don't really think about what is being stated when they say this word. When people say non-denominational, most of the time what is meant when you hear that is anything goes. In other words, they're not really affiliated with a, spe a specific or a particular group of, of individuals, a, a particular belief, and so really it's anything goes. It's, you know, we are non-denominational means that we're just, uh, uh, we're just a Heinz 57. We'll take any and everything, and we'll mix a little bit of this and a little bit of that, and we'll, we'll do what we want to. So the term non-denominational is really a, a misnomer. It's really a, a, a misname because it's not really accurate. But we'll use it in that term for our discussion tonight. We'll use it in that way, the way that most people mean it, tonight. Because when people say non-denominational, they really want to say that there is no distinction uh, between everybody. There, you know, we don't want to focus on the differences. We want to focus on the generalities. And so they start saying there's no essentials. There's nothing really important or pertinent that has to be taught except maybe a couple things, and everything else is just general. You know, you can kind of believe the way you want to in a lot of things. Maybe just one or two things is, is what's most important. Here's an example of individuals who want to focus only on the generalities and not on the essentials. I believe the way I believe because I believe the Bible teaches that. However, these things that I'm talking about, how many still with me? 
this morning say amen. All these things are non-essential for salvation. They have nothing to do with salvation. It's just methods, modes, difference. Thus, you have different denominations. That's why a lot of these different denominations were set up, because of the different methods. Some a little different doctrine on certain things. But you know what? By and large, most of the people that you believe, that you run into, and a lot of these churches I'm talking about around here believe that Jesus Christ is the way, the truth, and the life. And no man comes to the Father but by Jesus. Say amen. How many still with me? Denomination is not faith. Denomination is style of worship. And in one thing about believing in God, we all have to be Christians and be saved. And that's the faith part. Okay. Right? And so, just like for, for me, if I like to praise and worship with music and and shouting and that, that type of thing, then that's my style of worship. Other people worship in different types of ways. God allows them to find where they are comfortable in. Everybody's not comfortable in the same type of church setting. See, everybody has their own preferences, you know. You like you like uh, KFC original, and I like spicy recipe, you know. But it doesn't matter. So you may like Burger King, and I like McDonald's. It really doesn't matter. It's just the way you like it. I won't singing and shouting, and I won't mess with the with the specifics. We'll just take generalities. Everybody just has to be a Christian. If everybody loves God, by and large, everybody's praising Jesus. Friends, that is the non-denominational view of truth. And I'm here to tell you that, that the fact of the matter is there is some specifics that we have to get, get, uh, uh, get down to. We have to deal with some specifics if we are going to have unity and if we are going to be pleasing to God as He wants us to be, if we're going to be truly non-denominational, that is, we're going to get away from all the man-made churches and man-made creeds and doctrines and catechisms, and we're just going to get back to the Bible, then we have to get to some specifics. But you see, nobody wants to really get into the specifics. Nobody really wants to deal with the specifics. They want to just say Jesus. You see, as long as you profess Jesus, that's all that really matters to most of these folks. That's the non-denominational view of things is to not get into the specifics. See, I'm going to let you deal with the specifics the way you want to, and you let me deal with the specifics the way I want to. But other than that, we're just going to say Jesus... And, and everything goes, you see. It doesn't really matter as long as we say Jesus. Listen to these individuals. You otherwise. Anything that adds anything to Christ is an apostate church. Anything that says it's Jesus plus anything, my friend, is wrong. And you need to understand that the reason that Christ... All right, anything added to Jesus is wrong. That's it. See, you just have to have Jesus. Well, but isn't it the case that they add all these non-essentials to Jesus? You see? You see, the problem is they want to say just Jesus, but in, in the back of their minds, what they're really saying, like Tim Water, what he's really saying is when you add some things to Jesus that I don't add, then you're really wrong. He won't come out and say that. But that's really what they're saying. You're the things that you you deal with, the, the styles and the methods you deal with, you're really wrong, is what they're really saying. But the the, uh, uh, the the facade, if you will, the, 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 the curtain that's covering everything that no one wants you to look behind is really the idea of you just say Jesus and I'll leave you alone. As long as you believe Jesus, I'll leave you alone and we won't get into specifics. We won't talk about specifics. We won't talk about differences and uh, we'll just agree to disagree. The Marksville Church of God loves everybody. I don't care what church you're in. <laughs> Every church that names the name of Jesus Christ, the Baptist churches, the Methodist churches, the churches of God, the Pentecostal Holiness Church, all the different churches in the area that believe that the Word of God is the infallible Word of God, they have saved people sitting in those churches today, and they are my brothers and our sisters, and I want you to know that we're with them 100%. Every church that names the name of Jesus Christ, the Baptist churches, the Methodist churches, the churches of God, the Pentecostal Holiness Church, all the different churches in the area, they are my brothers and our sisters, and I want you to know that we're with them 100%. The way I believe because I believe the Bible teaches that. However, these things that I'm talking about, all these things are not essential 
essential for salvation. All these things are not essential for salvation. They have nothing to do with salvation. It's just methods, modes, difference. Thus, you have different amounts. By and large, most of the people that you believe, that you run into, and a lot of these churches I'm talking about around here believe that Jesus Christ is a way, the truth, and the life. And a lot of these churches I'm talking about around here believe that Jesus Christ is the way, the truth, and the life. And no man comes into the Father. And I thank God that in these last of the last days, the denominational walls coming down, we just had a, had a group here from Freedom Baptist Church. Mm -hmm. You're from the Church of God. Yeah. I'm, I'm non-denominational. Some people call it charismatic. Some people call it crazy man. And can you believe we all get along? That's right. Because it's one God, one yeah. Jesus, one yeah. cross. Yeah. And it's like I told people before, uh, I, I know it's a, it's a church up here in Marvel that don't get along with much of anybody. But I, I talked with the people at that church, and, and I told them, I said, you know, we may not agree on doctrine, but one thing we've got to agree on is who Jesus is. Right. And right. we've got to agree on the cross, mm -hmm. and we've got to agree on the blood. And if we don't agree in the, in the deity of Jesus, the sacrifice of Jesus, Right. The cross and the blood of Jesus. Right. Then we can't have fellowship. But uh, that we Jesus. did was gonna get us there. And I can fellowship with Baptist Methodists. I don't care. And I can fellowship with Baptist Methodists. I don't care. Right. If they can, if they can agree on the blood, if they can agree on the deity of Jesus. Now these people are getting the pulpit, and I've heard of preachers lately that have denied the deity of Jesus. No, I can't fellowship with them. But if you are in a church. Well, your pastor denied the deity of Jesus Christ. I suggest that you get out of it. But if you are in a church where your pastor denied the deity of Jesus Christ, I suggest that you get out of it. I don't care who you are. Now, did you hear what this last this last man said? He said, you know, uh, if we just believe on the blood and the deity and the cross, we can get along. And there's a church in Martinsville that don't get along with anybody. Now, who do you think that is? You know, they, those are the brethren that meet at H23 Starting Avenue, the Church of Christ, because we're always talking about the specifics. We have to be in agreement on all the specifics. And he's saying, no, let's just get with the generals. Let's just get with the generalities. The, the, do you believe in the deity of Christ? Now, if you don't believe in the deity of Christ, we can't have fellowship. But if, we, if you just believe in the blood, we can have fellowship. I can, he said, I can fellowship the, the Baptists, the Methodists, whoever. I don't care. It doesn't make any difference to him. Well, I'm telling you, friends, it does make a difference. It makes a difference to us, and it makes a difference to God. It makes a difference to God. It doesn't matter whether it makes a difference to us or not, but it does make a difference if you want to be pleasing to God. You can't just say, you do your thing and I'll do our thing, and we'll be non-denominational together. We'll just let everything go. You see, if we're really talking about pleasing, being pleasing to God, we're going to have to do more than just talk about generalities. We can't just go around and say, all denominations are one and we're pleasing to God. Because if we do that, friends, here's going to be the dangerous consequences. There are going to be some severe consequences to it that we are not going to want to deal with. We don't want the consequences of, of what we're saying when people say, you do your thing and I do my thing. Now listen to what this man says and then we'll move on to the consequences. But listen to what he says about one God and how we're all one. But when you get on TV and to start bringing up what people say, that's their ministry. We're all one. We're all a one. You know, one God. Is that correct? Is it one God? Yeah, but we're not all one. Yes, we are. No, we're not. one God. We are one. One body. Mm. The church is one universe. Um, I read the Bible, and I read the Bible, and um, you were talking about earlier about, uh, you know, the different nominations like Baptist and Presbyterian right. and all that. Right. All right. I, uh, the way I look at it, you know, when you go to heaven, all the nominations are going to be up there together in heaven. So God loves everybody. I don't care what church you're in. <laughs> Every church that names the name of Jesus Christ, the Baptist churches, the Methodist churches, the churches of God, the Pentecostal Holiness Church, all the different churches in the area that believe that the Word of God is the infallible Word of God, they have saved people sitting in those churches today, and they are my brothers and our sisters, and I want you to know that we're with them 100%. Amen. Somebody shout hallelujah. I like what you just said. Family. Yes, a family. Nothing about denomination. 
No. Family. No. It's, well, the denomination, you, you can't find it in the Word. Right. Uh, uh, there's only one body. Mm -hmm. There's only one Lord. I mean, we all can serve the same true and living God and maybe have different form of religion, you know. I mean, God's body just consists of many, maybe different parts. You understand what I'm trying mm -hmm. to say? Many members. Right. That's what I'm trying to say, you know. I believe the way I believe because I believe the Bible teaches that. However, these things that I'm talking about, how many still with me this morning say amen? All these names are not essential for salvation. They have nothing to do with salvation. It's just methods, modes, difference. Thus, you have different denominations. That's why a lot of these different denominations were set up because of the different methods. Some a little different doctrine on certain things. But you know what? By and large, most of the people that you believe, that you run into, and a lot of these churches I'm talking about around here believe that Jesus Christ is the way, the truth, and the life. And no man comes to the Father but by Jesus. Amen? How many still with me? All right. Now, all these people are saying, you know, we're all one, all one. By the way, the gentleman that called in and was talking to Jessica there, who was saying, you know, many members in one body, that gentleman has obeyed the gospel, and he's out of denominations. He came out of those man-made churches, and he's a member of the body of Christ, and I'm proud to call him my brother. As a matter of fact, six years ago, he made a challenge that he was going to answer us on instrumental music, prove that it was right, and he studied it, and he realized that it wasn't what the Bible taught. And so I appreciate you, Brother Eugene, and I, I'm glad that you're, you're my brother. I'm glad to call you my brother now. But if people are going to say... You know, we're all one. All these differences are non-essential. Many members in one body. If we're going to say it doesn't really matter, denomination not in the Bible, but we're still going to do what we want to do, are you ready for the consequences? You see, friends, when you start saying you do what you want to do and we'll just, we'll just accept it all, well, one day something's going to happen. Something's going to happen that you're not going to accept, but you really can't stop it because you opened the door. You open the door to this nonsense about it doesn't matter what you say, it doesn't matter what you do, it doesn't matter what you believe or what you practice, and so you've opened the door and now something's going to creep in and you're going to have a hissy fit about it, but there's nothing you can do, you see? And this is what I'm talking about. Here's an example of a non-denominational prayer. Now remember, non-denominational means anything goes. We will... We'll say what we want to say, do what we want to do, and we'll say it's non-denominational, and you can't accuse, you can't criticize. You can't judge against it. And that's the way everybody believes. But think about this. If you are not concerned about specifics, and you're going to say they're all or non-essentials, then one day the essentials that you really hold near and dear to your heart, and you say this is what you've got to believe, someone else is going to come along and say, no, that, that's really not essential either. And you won't have any leg to stand on to, to combat it. Now, this is what I'm talking about. Here's an article from the Washington Times. The title says, Virginia police chaplains resign after faith conflict. Now, there's a conflict with the chaplains in the state police of Virginia. And the conflict is, the conflict is this. Six of 17 chaplains on the Virginia State Police Force have resigned following a request that they stop denominational prayers during department-sanctioned public events and ceremonies, state police said. Now notice, denominational prayer. Well, we don't want denominations anyway, right? That's what all you are saying. Denomination, not the Bible. You know, it, that's not right. We're, we're not denominations. Or we're all one together. So what if we're denominations? Y'all don't make a big difference, d deal about it anyway, one way or the other. So why would you have a problem... If the chief of police comes in and says, you need to stop denominational prayers. Well, see, here's the problem. Here's the problem that everybody has. It's because of the definition of denominational. Now, notice this. Colonel uh, Flaherty, I guess I'm pronouncing the name right, said in a statement that a decision by the Fourth, Cir Fourth Circuit Court of Appeals prompted him to ask department chaplains to offer non-denominational prayers at public events like trooper graduations and an annual memorial service. So, stop the denominational prayers 
and start with the non-denominational prayers. Now, non-denominational anything else is fine. Everybody said, well, I'm not denominational. Oh, okay. Well, you're, you're open-minded. You're, you're great. That's wonderful. We all, we all brethren anyway. Everybody welcomes everybody else in, all these non-denominational groups out here, calling, them, calling themselves by some of these uh, the most uh, outlandish names, you know, Church of the For Firstborn Free Deliverance, uh, washed in the blood number three. Oh, that's a non-denomination. Oh, okay, fine. You worship the way you want to worship. You pray the way you want to pray. You sing the way you want to sing. Well, here comes the chief of police. He comes in and he says, you need to stop the denominational prayers. And you need to start with the non-denominational prayers. Well, if that was anything else, that would be fine and dandy. But all of a sudden, chaplains have a problem with it. And here's why. You see, the problem they have is the definition of non-denominational. In a statement, in a statement uh, that uh, Colonel uh, Flaherty, the state police su superintendent, asked, uh, said he asked chaplains to offer non-denominational prayers at denominational sanctioned public events, but that the request does not apply to private ceremonies or individual counseling. We still haven't figured out what non-denominational prayers are. Well, here we have. He said his decision was in response to a recent federal appeals court ruling that a Fredericksburg City Council member may not pray in Jesus' name during council meetings because the opening invocation is government speech. So now here's the definition of a non-denominational prayer. You just can't say in Jesus' name. Now, wait a minute. Why are you getting upset about that? The man just said it's non-denominational. I thought non-denominational and everything else was fine. I thought it was all just the non-essentials. See? I thought this was just a style. Why can't we say this is just a method? Why can't we say this is just a, you know, a, a version of the way someone wants to do it? You know, you might want to hoop and holler and shout on the ground, and you might want to have a big band, and the colonel here, he says, you know what, I just want a non-denominational prayer that doesn't say anything about Jesus. You know, I just kind of want a plain Jane one. I just want a very simple, uh, non-specific prayer. Now, you folks don't have any problems with that in any other realm of the religious world. You don't have any problem with the non-denominational non label and other things. Why, all of a sudden, do you have a big hissy fit when, when the, uh, the colonel comes in and says, well, you know what, let's just make it a non-denominational prayer. You know, let's... Let's let it fit everyone. Isn't that what we're all talking about? Isn't that what you all profess you want? Is someone to do their own thing, say their own thing, be free to do what they want to do. So why are you making a big deal about it? And I'll tell you something. If anyone is non-denominational, you know, if anyone can, can uh, fit the bill of non-denominational, it would be chaplains. I mean, chaplains, they're all things to all people no matter what faith they are, so-called faith. You know, if they're Baptist, they're Methodist, Pentecostal, Presbyterian, Apostolic, Lutheran, whatever, they, they, they wear that hat. And so why would chaplains of all people be upset about a non-denominational prayer? Sounds to me like you're just getting over there into those non-essential things and you're making a big deal about nothing. Sounds to me like you're making a non-essential thing something that's essential. Why can't someone just pray? Why can't someone just pray and not say in Jesus' name? Why can't they just pray? And you say, oh, that's fine. He just prayed. He's praying the way he wants to. That's what you do in everything else. You see? You say, well, I do what I want to do and everything's fine. Then. And don't you dare judge me. But yet you turn around and open the door. And when someone like the colonel comes in and says, offer a non-denominational prayer without saying in Jesus' name, oh, you know, you get mad in a wet hen. You get so upset and frustrated because all of a sudden now someone has decided that they're going to take away what you think is essential and put it into the non-essential category. Now, why are you so upset about that? Why are you so upset about that? And like we said... If anybody could do that, a chaplain could do that. I mean, a chaplain, a chaplain is like this guy. He comes in and he decides on the occasion which hat he's going to wear. He goes to visit somebody in prison, and guess what? Death row, he's going to counsel with this prisoner. He, 
Well, well, what faith are you, son? Well, I'm a Baptist. Okay, let me put my Baptist hat on. He goes to the next guy. Well, what, what, what's your faith? Well, I'm a Methodist. Oh, let me put my Methodist hat on. Oh, I'm a Catholic. Well, let me put my little collar on. You see? He's a, he's a man to everybody. He really has no convictions. i tell you why. I think chaplains are probably the least convicted persons in religion, and they make me the most sick. Of all the, of all the hypocrisy and all the lack of, of any kind of, of uh, doctrine or any kind of degree of virtue, a chaplain has the least, if you ask me. He has no convictions whatsoever when it comes to the truth. Oh, oh, I guess you have to believe Jesus. But other than that, anything goes. Now, I wonder what Dr. Andre Saunders of the Seventh-day Adventist Church would say about that. You know, he's a chaplain in the, in the Air Force, United States Air Force. I wonder how he wears all these different hats. How can he be a devout Seventh-day Adventist and then wear all these hats and minister to all these people and without making the distinctions without without saying you know what Mr. Presbyterian you're not right because you think worshiping on the first day of the week is, is right and that's just wrong I'm a seventh day Adventist and I'm, bound, I'm here to tell you that it's wrong how can you be convicted that the seventh day Adventist church is right and be a chaplain and tell all these individuals that they're right how can that be I'll tell you how it can be it's because we have been told that we're bad people if you don't let people have their denominational freedom. We're told that, that we're bad persons if we, if we start focusing upon the specifics and not letting people have the generalities that they really want. See, but I'm going to tell you, friends, that the problem that we have is when you start saying, Nothing is really essential except maybe one or two things like Jesus. Well, somebody's going to come along and say, well, ending a prayer in Jesus' name is not really essential. Then you're going to have a fit, but you can't because you open the door. You see? Here's what you have. You have individuals like us in the Church of Christ on one hand, and we say the Bible teaches there is one church. And you have to be in that one church to be saved. There's only one kind of church in the Bible. One kind of church in the Bible. It's the church Jesus died for, Acts 20, 28. It's the church that he said he would build, Matthew 16, 18. It's the church that you have to be a member of to be saved because it's the body of Christ, Ephesians 1, 22 and 23. And he's the savior of the body, Ephesians 5, 23. We say that. We say that's specifics. And we say baptism is for the remission of sins because Peter said in Acts 2.38, he said that baptism doth also now save us, 1 Peter 3.21. Paul was told to wash away your sins, Acts 22.16, and all of you individuals over here in the non-denominational crowd are the crowd that says, let's, you know, let's not be too specific. Y'all get mad at us and say, oh, y'all just binding things that God didn't bind. God gives me the freedom to do that. God doesn't care if we, if we teach this or if we believe this. And y'all get all upset about us because we're too specific. Y'all, y'all, are, not, y'all are binding the non-essentials. That's what we're told. But then someone comes along like the state chief of police and he says... Well, don't say in Jesus' name it's too denominational. You see, you folks over here, y'all tell us, well, that's, that's too denominational. Y'all are being too specific. But someone else comes along and says that what you're doing is too denominational, and y'all get all upset. Oh, no, you, you can't take that out. That's not specific enough. You've got to say the name, in the name of Jesus. You can't take that away. That's the essentials. You see? But you open the door. You let it come in. So why is it that you would condemn the chief of police for saying offer a non-denominational prayer when you yourself do the same thing when it comes to what God says? You see, the things that God says aren't essential enough for you all. Mark 16, 15 to 16, 
Jesus said unto them, Go ye into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. He that believeth and is baptized shall be saved, but he that believeth not shall be damned. Now that's what, that's what Jesus said. That's what our Lord said. I would say that is essential. If our Lord commanded that it be done, he commanded his apostles to do it, as he's ascending up into heaven, and, he's, and he is telling them the last things that they need to do in order to carry out his will, preach the gospel to every creature, he that believeth and is baptized shall be saved, he that believeth not shall be damned. Now I'd say that's pretty essential. But for some reason... For some reason, all of you people who say there are no essentials, you know that we can't have too many essentials, for some reason, it's it's not acceptable. And the only thing that is acceptable is denying that the command that our Lord gave is essential. Now, if you want to deny the, the things that we know are essential, How can you get mad for someone who claims to be doing something in the name of non-denominationalism and getting rid of something that you have already said is not is not essential? How can how can you do that? Listen to what these guys, these preachers say about the essential things that Christ said. You are funny. And you're not real. He that believeth and is baptized shall be saved, he that believeth not shall be damned. Now notice, he that believeth and is baptized shall be saved, but he that believeth not shall be damned. He didn't say nothing about baptism, the second part of that, uh, or the last part of that phrase there, and and he that believeth not shall be damned. You don't get to heaven by word of baptism. You get there by faith. Well, if if in Mark chapter 16, 16, he that believeth and is baptized shall be saved, then... How come you think that he says, he that believeth not shall be damned? How come did he not put baptism in there if baptism was a necessary part of salvation? There are an overwhelming number of verses that tell us this. For example, probably one of the most well-known books, and Johnny's already cited from it in the New Testament, is the Gospel of John. It was written for the specific purpose to tell people how to have eternal life and know Jesus Christ. The statement of purpose is found in John chapter 20, verse 31. But these are written that you might believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that believing you might have life through his name. There are 99 promises of eternal life in the Gospel of John for the one who has put his faith in Jesus Christ. Baptism is only mentioned incidentally in the Gospel of John. Larry, I'm not sure where you're getting uh, that Paul was baptized and that's when he was sent or washed away. You, you, you did not get that from the Bible. Um, and, and let me clarify again. I, all of us believe you should absolutely be baptized. No question about it. The question we answered a while ago is, does your salvation depend upon it? Now, I cannot imagine somebody coming to the Lord, asking them, asking God to forgive them of their sins, them not having the opportunity to be baptized, and because they didn't have that opportunity, they, they went to hell. I, I just can't believe that. 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 Um, that is inconsistent with Scripture. And so, again, you should be baptized. Um, we believe you should be baptized, but your salvation does not depend upon that act of baptism. Now, can you believe the audacity of these guys? You know, here's Mr. Bon Jovi, and here he is saying that, you know, God commanded it. We believe he, he commanded it, but it's not essential. Now, if you're going to say that something so specifically stated as he that believeth and is baptized shall be saved is non-essential, then... Why would you get upset when the chief police comes along and says, well, why don't you just offer a prayer and leave out in the name of Jesus? You see? Why would you get upset about that? You don't have a problem getting rid of what God says and other things. You don't have a problem just uh, getting rid or cutting out of or disrespecting God's commands when he says specifically what to do. So why do you get mad when someone else throws out a command? that God says. You see? See the hypocrisy, friends? 
when you start saying, well, let's just deal in the essentials, well, who's going to determine what the essentials are? How about doing what God says to do when it comes to salvation and let that be the essential? You see, in Hebrews 5 and verse 9, Jesus says that, that uh, or excuse me, Paul says that Christ became the author of salvation to all who will obey. Hebrews 5 and verse 9. Now, who's going to say what is essential and what's not essential? How about the essentials? are obedience to God's commands. How about the essentials being the things that God commands do? Let me ask you this, friends. Are you going to tell me that when Jesus says in John 8 and verse 24, I said therefore unto you that you shall die in your sins, for if you believe not that I am he, you shall die in your sins. Is believing in Christ, is that, an, is that essential? Is that something that we, we have to do? Or could that be a non-essential? You say, I don't know uh, what the qualifications are. I don't know what the criteria is for determining what is essential and what is non-essential in the non-denominational view of things. Can we say that's just non-essential? That's not really an essential, believing in Christ. Well, someone says, well, yeah, it has to be because Christ commanded it. He said that you have to believe, you must believe, it is a necessity if you're going to be saved. Otherwise, you'll die in your sins. Okay, okay, I guess I'll go with that. I guess we could say that. Well, what about this? What about repenting of your sins? Is that going to be an essential? Is that going to be something that we have to do? Let's just see. Paul said, The times of this ignorance God winked at, but now commandeth all men everywhere to repent. Now, is that an essential? Or is that a non-essential? Is that something that we're all going to agree on has to be done? See, I think most people are going to agree, yes, that, that has to be done. That's a command. God commanded it. Well, what about, what about confessing Christ? Is that essential? Is that necessity? Or is that something that we can just throw out the window to? See, what is essential and what is non-essential? What about confessing Christ? In Acts 8, verse 36... It seemed to be essential because as Philip and the eunuch went on their way, the Bible says they came to a certain water, and the eunuch said, See, here is water. What doth hinder me to be baptized? And Philip said, uh, If thou believest all in heart, thou mayest. And he answered and said, I believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. I think that sounds pretty essential to me. Sounds like it's pretty specific. Must be, must be necessary because it was hindering the eunuch from doing something else, so it was standing in the way. So everybody's going to say, yeah, I think that's essential. That must be essential. Well, why is it that when we get to the next command, uh, why is it that when we get to the next command about uh, uh, baptism, why is it that people have so much uh, trouble with what the Bible says? Why is it that people have so much trouble doing what, what Jesus says when it comes to uh, being baptized? There in Mark 16, 16. Why, why is that so difficult? You don't have any trouble saying it's, it's a necessity everywhere else. Jesus commands something. Why do you say it's so difficult? Or why is it such a non-essential See, why don't, you, why don't you moan and groan? Why don't you throw a fit about this being thrown out like you have a, a problem with the chaplains, you know, being told, well, you don't offer a prayer and say in the name of Jesus. That's too denominational. You know, that's too specific. That might offend someone. How come you don't have a fit about that? I'll tell you why. It's because you really don't believe it. You really don't believe what God says. You think that you can deal with the generalities and you can pick and choose what you want to do and say, well, those are the essentials. You see? You have determined what you want to do and you really don't care what God says, do you? You really don't care what God says. That's why you don't have a problem with it. You don't have a problem with uh, uh, disobeying God concerning the things that you don't see as essential. I'm trying to find this man that says, uh, 
repentance and belief and I call him the waffle man maybe that's what I need to search for but here's I think this is a, a classic example of what individuals out there uh, believe I, I believe that's this is what what he says double talk here because uh, Sunday night Sunday night you were saying say at the point of faith then you want to add repent then you want to add confess <clears throat> you can't keep the law you can't keep the law you can't keep the law I got it you on the work from the Lord uh, how you doing? I'm doing well uh, I'm not on the air am I you are on the air oh okay uh, I, I'm sorry I didn't know <laughs> do you want uh, to yes, be on the air I'd like to speak with you for a minute about the last passage you was reading in Mark Okay. Um, I understand what you were saying, and I agree with you 100%, but this frightens me. Uh, if you read on down the next verse, uh, well, uh, perhaps you could do it better on the air. Uh, verse 17? And 18. Okay. Yes, yes. 18 specifically, yes. All right. And they shall take up serpents. Let's just go ahead and read 17. And these signs shall follow them that believe. That's right. In These my, signs shall follow them that what? That believe. In my name shall they cast out devils. All right. They shall speak with new tongues. Okay. Then in 18, they shall take up serpents. You know, I for years I condemned those people because I was in the church that I won't speak about that the people out in the deserts did this stuff, you know, and, and I thought they was nuts. But the Bible actually says this. Now, this is in red. It's Jesus' words. Go ahead, please. And they shall take up serpents, and they shall drink any deadly thing. And if they shall drink any deadly thing, it shall not hurt them. And Amen, they yeah. And they shall lay hands on the sick, and they shall recover. Amen. Okay. Now, let's, let's, let's read the next verses. How about that? Okay, and yes, let's, sir. Yes. And let's see what these signs... Let's see what the point or the purpose of these signs are going to be, okay? Because yes, the next verses are going to tell why these signs were going to follow. Verse 19. So then after the Lord had spoken unto them, he was received up into heavens and sat on the right hand of God. And they went forth and preached everywhere. Now watch it. The Lord working with them, confirming the word with signs following. So, the signs. Yes, sir. so the purpose of all those signs that followed was for what reason? The signs. Why did the signs follow? Well, it says these signs shall follow them. I know, but in verse 20 tells us the purpose of the signs following. Right here. Can you read this? Y yes, sir. I'm reading. All right. Well, you, if you confirming could, the con word. Confirming the word with the signs following. That so, they were saved and... No, 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 that is not what it says. Confirming the word with signs following. Not confirming they were saved, but confirming the word that they were preaching. I, I'm confused, so okay. that's why I called. Let, let, let's, let's, think, let's, let's, let's work this out. When, when Mark was writing this, or when the New Testament was being... When the New Testament was uh, was being written, did they have all the New Testament? Well, I suppose they probably had the majority of it, but no, no they didn't have all of it. No, because no, they were writing it as it went along, right? Yes, sir. Matthew, so, Mark, probably Luke, and John were probably written all at the same time. So, but 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 Roman Acts and Romans and all the way through Revelation, Revelation th those later, were yes, those were being written. As see, we read we read the events and they're already happened, but what is you know what's going on in the Bible is being written down, you know, in progression. 
In other words, when what Jesus... scared me was is it says that these are the signs that shall follow them. All right. But, but Wait a minute, look. okay, it says these are the signs that shall follow them. It doesn't say that they will do it. But here's, here's the thing. But they'll but, follow them. But here's the signs that we're following. That believe. And what was it doing? It was confirming the word. Let me, let me just use, talk about it this way. If I tell you I have a word from the Lord and you don't have the Bible, or you don't have the New Testament, and I'm going to tell you, sir, I have a message from God, and God tells you, and then I tell you whatever God wants you to, wants you to know, how are you going to know if I'm telling you something from God or not? How do you know if it's, going to, if it's coming from God or if it's just coming from James's mouth? Well, that's a good question. Uh, I know that in my heart. No, you don't. No, if I told you, if I told you that what you need to do to be saved is you need to go jump off the mountain, then I don't believe you. Why? What the Bible says. Well, but the, let's say the Bible hadn't been written yet. Because see, the the New Testament wasn't written when Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, and Peter and Paul were going out preaching. It wasn't all written. So there had to be a way to prove to the people who were listening that, hey, this is from God. You see, okay. if, if you didn't have the Bible, you didn't have the Bible, and you lived, out, you lived back in the first century, and I came to you and I said, uh, I said, sir, God wants you to go jump off the mountain. Now, how are you going to know if I'm telling you what I'm telling you is from God or not? That's a good question because I was getting ready to drink something to try to, to you know, I mean, I, I'm thinking that way. You know, that's the thing that scared me. I'm thinking that I should take up serpents and I should drink deadly well, things just to. But I'm saying, sir, you shouldn't. Here's why. If I told you. In God. If I told, if I told you, if I, you didn't have the New Testament and you're trying to find out whether or not what I'm telling you is from God, you know what you need to do? You need to see a demonstration that will prove what I'm telling you from God. Now, let's let's see if that's if let's see if that's how You don't tempt God, no sir. No, no that's just, right, that's right. Now let's let's just see if we can find out where the some signs were used to confirm the word. Okay? Now watch this. First Corinthians chapter two and verse four. Now Look what Paul says. Paul says, My speech and my preaching was not with enticing words of man's wisdom. He said, When I came talking to you, it wasn't just with good and pretty speeches. He said, But in demonstration of the Spirit and of power. Why? That your faith should not stand in the wisdom of men, but in the power of God. Mm -hmm. Now, if I came to you and I said, Sir... God wants you to jump off the mountain. You would say, well, I want some confirmation that that's from God. Because, see, you can't go to the book. See, the book's not written yet. So you can't go and find out if God said it in the Bible. You I believe exactly what it says. I, I know, but I'm saying if the Bible wasn't written yet, you would need to have some way to prove that, th that what I was telling you was from God. See? And so what you would want to see is you want to see a demonstration. You'd want to see a demonstration of the Spirit and of power so that you know, you know what, this man, there's no way this man could be telling me something or he couldn't be doing this unless he had the power of God. Therefore, I'm going to believe what he says. Now, if someone came to me and says, James, jump off the mountain. God told me to tell you to jump off the mountain. I'm going to say, prove it. You see? You either give me a demonstration, a supernatural demonstration that what you're saying comes from God, or I'm not going to believe it. Now today, it. today what I'm going to do is I'm going to say, show it to me in the Bible. See, because I, you, you and I, we have the book today. Well, if you if you turn with me, uh, I, I appreciate you doing what you're doing, and thank you very much. Right. Um, go, go ahead. You got another, you have another. You want to go no, somewhere else? Yes, sir, I would. Right. If you would with me, uh, I'd like to go to 1 Corinthians 12. All right. And it talks about spiritual gifts. Okay. And I believe that. Okay. I but believe that the Lord has given us, uh, when we are saved, 
We're given but, spiritual gifts. But but it gets back, sir, but it gets back to... But how come everybody's got the same gift and nobody has any of the other ones? That's a good question. I'd good. like to know that, too. Everybody's got speaking in tongues, right? But nobody can't heal. Nobody can't prophesy. What's wrong with that? There's something wrong with it, isn't I, it, sir? I believe so. I believe you're onto something. And you know what I say it is? The problem is? They don't believe. No. I say the problem is... They don't have these gifts because these gifts were used for a certain purpose. And that was to confirm the word that was being spoken. Amen. Very See? good. Very good. So, so let me ask you this. Can, can I get your first name just so we can be on a first name basis? His name is Kenneth. 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 So let me ask you this. If, if you didn't have the book, if you didn't have the Bible... To confirm what God says, you would need a supernatural demonstration to confirm the word, right? If you didn't have this book. If I didn't have the book, then I wouldn't have read it. And no, but, but, if I but, had not have read it, then I would not have needed anything to confirm anything. No, you would, you would definitely need a supernatural manifestation of the Spirit to prove what someone was saying. But today, if you want to prove what God says, guess what you do? You just go to the book. See? If someone came to me, if, if somebody came to me and said, James, this is what God says, I'm going to say one of two things. You're going to prove it one of two ways. You're either going to do a supernatural demonstration, 1 Corinthians 2, 4. Are you going to die? Uh, no, or you're going to show it to me in the book. One of, one of two. And I know what they can't do. They can't do a demonstration. So they're going to have to show it to me in the book. And when they can't show it to me in the book, you know what I'm going to say? I ain't going to believe you. You see? That was the thing that bothered me about the mark. Uh, you know, after I had read that, I read what you was reading, but uh -huh. read on. I'm not the kind of person who just stops. You know, I read on below it, and, right. and it bothered me what it said about taking up the serpents and casting out devils. And so on and so forth. And uh, I appreciate your time, and I really well, appreciate you talking to me. That's all right. I'm enjoying this because because notice it. Let me give you another ver another verse to show you. When we're talking about confirming the word, see, they had to prove that what they were saying was from God. Now look at what Hebrews two and verse three says. It says, "How shall we escape if we neglect so great salvation, which at the first, see, at the first began to be spoken by the Lord and was what? Confirmed. Confirmed unto us by them that heard him. Now how was it confirmed? God also bearing them witness both with signs and wonders and with diverse miracles and with gifts of the Holy Spirit.